right, uh, greetings everybody and uh, welcome to my continued series on uh, themes of the 20th century. We're going to take a little bit of a departure from uh, Europe and move into the United States for a little bit. Uh, if you're watching these lectures in order, I would recommend the uh, Cold War 1945 to 1949 lecture before this one because it gives you an idea of some of the international crisis uh, crises that were occurring that led to some of the tensions that would exist in the United States during the McCarthy period. A couple of things we have to consider by the end of World War II that there was um, an incredible sense of relief uh, that this war was finally over. There was a great sense that something truly malevolent had been defeated in Nazi Germany. But it's quite remarkable how quickly uh, the Soviet Union replaced Nazi Germany as uh, the demonized enemy. Um, and there were, of course, a lot of factors for why this happened. Um, and essentially, we're going to look at the main contributing factors that uh, allow something like McCarthyism to occur. Uh, we have not really seen anything on this scale uh, since or before. Some would argue that in our current era of Donald Trump, we've seen some of the gutter tactics that existed during the McCarthy period, and I'm a little apprehensive to compare those two periods while I do recognize um, some commonalities, particularly where the manipulation of fear is concerned. Um, and, uh, and I think what you may find is as we go through the background of this narrative, you're going to be able to identify uh, with some of the things that maybe we've experienced, even as Canadians, looking from afar, if you will, over the border through American media and certainly even through Canadian media, uh, a very uh, unique experience uh, occurring in the United States. So we're in a very, uh, very remarkable period of, of, of history at this time as well. Uh, so without further ado, here we have Joseph McCarthy here. We're going to talk quite a bit about him. And here's an old poster from uh, the American Communist Party, uh, probably back from the 1930s. All power to the workers, it says. Um, so let's begin. So the restored tolerance of communism as a result of the war ended quickly with the defeat of Hitler. Communism went through some very interesting phases uh, in terms of through, through American history. The first real uh, fear of communism that we saw in the United States would probably be uh, the fear of 1919 when there was a considerable amount of post-war labor disruption, a lot of uh, new immigrants that were perceived as stirring up radicalism. Um, so the Red Scare of 1919 was fairly significant. Uh, it would subside throughout much of the 20s because the economy was doing well. Um, radical politics didn't really exist on a mass scale in the United States at that time. Certainly when the Great Depression came and uh, the economy collapsed, and we saw an accelerated amount of people, uh, an increased amount of people rather, joining and flocking the Communist Party in the 1930s. Um, when the Soviet Union became the allies of the United States during World War II, there was this sort of sense that, well, you know what, we may not really like what they do or how they do things, but they are our allies and we need them. And we also know that during the 1940s, particularly that period from 1941 and 45, and what's interesting, both the United States and the USSR enter the war in uh, 1940. One, uh, on, on a significant level. The USSR had had some brush fire wars with Finland, of course. They'd invaded Poland in 1939, but after those two events in Finland and Poland, things had been pretty quiet for the Soviets until Nazi Germany invades in June of 1941. Um, during that period, we know that the Roosevelt administration had actively encouraged Hollywood to produce um, sort of pro-Soviet films, or maybe not, pro-Soviet might be a bit strong, but just to, uh, you know, demonstrate uh, how great the Russian people are and how hard they're working in their fight against fascism and how Uncle Joe is doing his duty. And, uh, you know, a lot of these studios in Hollywood obliged and, and made these films. And this will become a very important 
part of uh, the blacklisting that we will talk about shortly that occurs a little later. But um, So if you were a Communist Party member between 1941 and 1945, nobody really paid too much attention, nobody was that concerned about you, you may have been looked upon it with a bit of um, kind of confusion from people, but for the most part nobody really was too concerned about it. But as soon as that war comes to an end and the Cold War begins, all those people who had been associated with the party since the Depression years and during the war years were suddenly looked at uh, very differently than they were uh, prior to that period. The Cold War transformed domestic communism from a matter of political opinion to one of national security. This is central to the discourse that was occurring in the United States after 1945. What if all those people who had joined the party, uh, particularly if you were in government, let's say, if you were a bureaucrat of some kind, you may be in a position to somehow undermine American democracy. And uh, that becomes a legitimate fear for many Americans uh, and policymakers during the immediate post-war period. <coughs> The uh, CPUSA, which meets the Communist Party of the United States of America, became viewed as potential enemy agents. Now, while there may not be any direct link or proof as of yet, there was a sense that we need to keep an eye on these guys because we don't know if they're serving as spies or yes-men to orders from Joseph Stalin. And certainly in the immediate post-World War II period, we saw Eastern Europe... Um, being entirely directed by the Soviet Union. There was a, not a lot of uh, independent policy making going on in Czechoslovakia and, and uh, Hungary and uh, Poland at the time. So there was reasonable um, uh, context for people to be concerned. All right. So McCarthy would not have been relevant had it not been for these world events. What I want to do is take you through just a quick checklist of the things that were occurring. Now, <clears throat> you have to consider that Americans are reading the papers and they're seeing these things happen. Rapid fire succession. And even if they didn't fully understand, what they saw through American media was this menacing Soviet Union that seemed to be on the march, on the move. For me, the beginning of the Cold War uh, that in itself is another debate and question. We could argue that, uh, you know, the revolution of 1917 uh, is when the Cold War begins, and even more specifically the Russian Civil War, when the Allies intervene in um, the Bolshevik Revolution temporarily. Uh, but we'll come back and look at that when we look at the Russian Revolution. Um, FDR, as we said in our last lecture, uh, that he'd spent a lot of time trying to nurture this relationship with Stalin. And Stalin didn't trust anybody, um, but if he liked anyone or trusted anybody more than anybody else, it's probably fair to say that Franklin Roosevelt had been able to establish some type of relationship with Joseph Stalin. So when he dies, <coughs> two months after the Yalta Conference, excuse me, um, Harry Truman comes in and there's a, a whole shift in that relationship that had been so carefully manufactured by Franklin Roosevelt during the war years. Disagreement over the composition of, Pol of the Polish government, um, you know, in, in Yalta, of course, Frank, or rather, uh, Joseph Stalin had guaranteed free elections in Eastern Europe and Poland. Of course, he was not in the least bit interested in honoring uh, free elections, particularly if anti-communist governments were elected. Uh, we begin to see Soviet pressure put on Turkey and also on Iran in 1946, so there were concerns about that, particularly in the regions where a lot of oil production is happening, which becomes center stage to the middle part of, middle, late part of the 20th century. Uh, the Greek Civil War, uh, of course, the Communist Partisans have been very effective in fighting against the Nazis during the war, and when the war is over, the Partisans want to continue their struggle to establish their own Greek Communist state. Um, we know, of course, now that Stalin had agreed to not intervene in Greece, and the Royalists the, would end up defeating the Communists, and in fact, it's in the Greek Civil War where we see Harry Truman um, offer his Truman aid for the first time. <coughs> 
There was a coup in Czechoslovakia in 1948, a pro-Soviet uh, coup overthrowing the government there. Uh, we talked about this last lecture, the Berlin blockade. Um, the Soviet actions there were very aggressive in trying to stop the Allies from entering Berlin or encouraging them to not come to Berlin. Um, the communist takeover in China, you know, boom, 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 one thing after another. Now keep in mind the communist movement in China had been, uh, you know, the, the 1949 takeover by the Communist Party of China, led by Mao Zedong, had been at the heel end of a near 25-year civil war and struggle against the Kuomintang, or the nationalists. So, so what was happening in China really had nothing to do with the Soviet Union, but from the American perspective, oh my gosh, here's a country with 25% of the world's population is now fallen under the Communist umbrella. And then in the same year, of course, the Soviet Union would detonate uh, their first nuclear bomb. So, this is important, once again, simply for the rapid succession of years. And as Americans read the headlines, <coughs> there is a natural and understandable fear of what on earth is happening here on the international landscape. 1950, a year later, we see the North Koreans invade the South, and that's just another thing that is instilling fear amongst Americans at home. So, a lot of things going on. Well, as we said in the beginning of the lecture, we now know that American communists were now simply being viewed as outlaws. They were no longer seen as sort of naive idealists. They were seen as potential enemies of American democracy. It was believed that American communists were part of a secret conspiracy under orders from Stalin. You know, this was not an unrealistic uh, thing to be concerned about at the time. So. You know, there was no way of knowing. I suppose you could do surveillance, and certainly later the FBI would get involved in, in surveying or, 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 or spying on people. Um, but that was the fear. Most American communists, though, were not ideological zombies, uh, but committed to a program of social change and equal rights. The tragedy is this, that most of the people who joined the Communist Party, particularly during the Depression years, were people who were out on the street, had lost everything in the crash of 29, were looking for alternatives, were drawn to the Communist Party because, it's a, because of its language of equality and fraternity. Uh, women joined the Communist Party because they felt that they would be treated equally. <coughs> and in many cases, they were. African Americans would actively join the party because through the Communist Party of the United States they saw an organization that would treat them as equals as well. So a lot of the people that joined the party were not necessarily interested in what was happening in the Soviet Union. They were interested in how they can, pr pr uh, how they can make their own lives better. People who were marginalized, immigrants, African Americans, women and others, saw through the Communist Party an opportunity to have a voice. However naive they may have been is a whole other question, but it's fair to say that the vast majority of people that joined the party did it for those reasons. Critics argue that communist sympathizers held sensitive positions in government. This is where things get murky. When you suggest that what if people uh, who are in a position to influence foreign policy, for example, are uh, not necessarily communists, but what were called pinkos, Soviet sympathizers, how and how could they and would they somehow subvert and manipulate our foreign policy to undermine the United States? It's not an unrealistic thing to imagine, uh, but nonetheless, that's where this thing percolates, and of course it spins out of control by the middle 1950s. <coughs> Oh, the FBI. Well, so much to tell you uh, about uh, J. Edgar Hoover. In fact, we really probably should come back and look at him um, on his own because his story uh, is, is also a very remarkable story. Uh, he was given the task of uh, uh, forming and developing the FBI in 1924, and over the course of the, the near 48 years, I believe, he was 
director of the FBI till 1972, he had built an apparatus of surveillance, of file keeping, of fingerprints, you name it, that didn't just stem from bootleggers of the 1930s and common criminals, but eventually uh, J. Edgar Hoover would amass a multitude of documents on key American figures, including people like John F. Kennedy, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, and many, many others who were deemed as problematic. Um, J. Edgar Hoover had so much power that it, I would argue that for many years I would say he was the most powerful person in the United States because he had the ability to blackmail people um, very effectively. He went on a very uh, horrible, hateful campaign against uh, Martin Luther King, which is well documented. He um, threatened to undermine John F. Kennedy uh, and his relationships with other women. He had pictures of him with other women and uh, all kinds of things. He had recordings of hotel rooms. You name it. He had all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, to give you an example of the kind of thing that J. Edgar Hoover could do, um, you know, when John F. Kennedy becomes president, it's customary for the uh, director to meet with the president and discuss with him. And apparently, uh, either very early on in their first uh, connection or there soon after, he had introduced himself to John F. Kennedy and said, look, Mr. President, I want to let you know we have some pictures in our file, um, but we, I'm telling you this because I want you to know that they're in good hands and you've got nothing to worry about. Right? What is he doing there? <laughs> it's pretty obvious. He's blackmailing him. Don't mess with me. Don't push my buttons. Don't do anything I don't want you to do because i got stuff that I can use against you. And he was notorious for doing these kinds of things. So, um, you know, uh, a remarkable a career, a remarkable person, a complex on so many levels. He rubbed elbows with mafia figures. He was known to uh, be a homosexual himself, although he he discriminated against homosexuals in the FBI. Um, you know, there's just all kinds of interesting layers to to um, uh, to J. Edgar Hoover. But for our purposes, looking at McCarthyism, he becomes important because. He's the one that has access to information, however um, fabricated it might be. He still had this information that he could pass on to figures who were looking at finding people in government who may be seen as potential communist sympathizers. So, J. Edgar Hoover, a strong anti-communist, was the driving force behind the Red Scare. And the FBI was given authority in 1947 to investigate government employees for political history. From 1947 to 1959, three million employees, government employees, were investigated, but nobody was charged with spying. And you think about the amount of effort and time and resources and money that went into investigating three million people only to fall short on everything. Um, it's a pretty remarkable waste of resources. 212, however, were deemed risks and were forced out of their jobs. Now, what does it mean to be a risk? And what were, what were the rules? Who wrote up the rules? Who determined these things? Um, an example of a, of, of a risk would be if your father was Russian and he fled Stalin's purges in the 30s. He probably likely anti-communist because of experiences, but simply for the fact that he came from a country that was now under communist control, or had been at the time that he left, you might be deemed a risk. If your father attended a communist party meeting in 1932, he as well could be deemed a risk. So those are the kind of things. The FBI would pass on information to an organization, but the acronym of which is HUAC, House Un-American Activities Committee. So, the House Un-American Activities Committee, which I will from this point forward refer to as HUAC, because it's quicker, shorter, um, was an organization that was actually developed during the war to root out Nazi sympathizers. Um, but when the war ended, uh, it just continued, uh, now persecuting or going after suspected communist sympathizers. Um, HUAC was kind of like a traveling courtroom 
that would travel from major city to major city. And for example, uh, if it went to Seattle, it would work its way down to San Francisco. And as it entered each city, it would call to testify people who'd been either accused of something or had been, um, or it had been made aware that certain individuals knew something about people who may be communist sympathizers. So all kinds of people would be called in front of this traveling courtroom. As we said, it began in the 30s finding Nazis, but quickly switched to Reds after the war. Uh, 1947, pardon me for the phone, uh, HUAC became big news as actors, writers, and Hollywood directors became a focus of investigation. So, um, basically what happens is, uh, why on earth are they going after Hollywood directors? I mean, one of the things that I find really amazing is the idea that people who live in beautiful homes have opulent lifestyles could be deemed as someone or uh, an organization of people who might be uh, suspected of being communist sympathizers. Um, so there is an irony there, isn't there, that people who are uh, um, wealthy um, could be communist sympathizers. Yeah, people in the Hollywood Hills with their Mercedes Benz and their Dom Perignon Champagne and all the money in the world are going to cash their chips and give it to the workers of of the Soviet Union is a ludicrous idea, but here is where the concern is. The concern is that Hollywood has the ability to subvert young minds through subtle forms of propaganda. Um, so in that regard, that was a big concern. If you were, you know, uh, making films that had pro-worker imagery or sympathetic to the Soviet Union, uh, that could be a major concern for American policymakers and for Americans in general. So uh, it's not surprising that certain workers and rather certain actors and writers and directors became a focus of this investigation. The Hollywood Ten pleaded the First Amendment out of principle and um, here they are here. Ten, I believe they were screenwriters though, not actors. Um, they wrote screenplays. Dalton Trumbo uh, would be one of the ten, a, a, a wonderful film uh, made called Trumbo is worth watching if you're interested in this topic. Um, basically these ten had made the decision that the witch hunts against communist sympathizers was immoral. So they would plead if, is it the First Amendment? Yeah, the First Amendment, which basically said, I refuse to say something for fear that it may incriminate me. Now, the problem with pleading the First was that um, it did incriminate you. Uh, <coughs> if you um, didn't say anything, you're saying, well, I'm not going to say anything because it may incriminate me. The feeling was that, well, then you were guilty. But still, it was within the rights of the American Constitution that people could plead the First Amendment. Many were blacklisted, like Charlie Chaplin, who, who moved out of the country. Uh, what a remarkable story there. Here he is, the godfather of American cinema, one of the wealthiest people in the United States, uh, who, albeit, did make very pro-Soviet statements. He called himself a communist. Uh, you know, a lot of these sort of intellectual, um, you know, Pablo Picasso called himself a communist, it almost became kind of fashionable to want to have debates and discussions about Marxist theory or what have you and and maybe it made these very wealthy people feel um, validated if they could claim to have their heart in the right place by supporting the cause of proletarian revolution but in reality I don't think Charlie Chaplin or I don't think uh, even Dalton Trumbo who was a Communist Party member as well um, these people never would have uh, given up their finances or their wealth to support communism in any way, but nonetheless, if you're wealthy and you've expressed these sympathies and you're in a position of influence, particularly in Hollywood, you are going to be uh, pointed at as a potential enemy. Well, here are a couple of high-profile cases. Alger Hiss, a high-ranking member of the State Department, was accused by a fellow named Whitaker Chamber of being a communist. You know, and this is a tragedy. That's all it took. Someone calls you a communist, the whole house of cards falls in on you. And just by being accused, everyone is like, oh my gosh, I can't have anything to do with you now. 
uh, hey, you know, I know you're my best pal, but please don't call me or come to my home anymore because if somebody sees you and I get accused, I'll lose my job too. So it puts people in a very, very difficult uh, set of circumstances. Truman dropped the case, but a young senator named Richard Nixon saw an opportunity. There he is up there with his infamous pumpkin papers where he claimed that they found some secret documents uh, within a pumpkin, I believe on a Maryland field, I think somewhere. Um, Alger Hiss would be charged with perjury, not spying, and spent five years in prison. Here was, now Alger Hiss should be noted that here's the guy who was one of the architects of the United Nations. Um, extremely high-ranking Democratic, uh, uh, you know, figure in the Roosevelt and the Truman administration. So, uh, you know, this was no small potatoes. This was not a low-level bureaucrat by any means. <coughs> and then, of course, here you have Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were tried in 51 and executed for treason for selling nuclear info to the Soviets. Um, you know, uh, you, and I believe, I remember hearing and reading many, many years ago when the Soviet Union collapsed and academics and historians and political scientists went to the Soviet Union to filter through the archives that in fact, apparently these two um, did uh, sell secrets uh, to the Soviet Union and many believe that it was their information that gave the Soviet Union the ability to create their own bomb, which they would detonate in 1949. So. Well, let's move into Joseph. There he is up there with his trusty friend and lawyer, Roy Cohn. What a, what a character he was as well. So, <clears throat> some politicians saw the political advantage of finding communists. Nixon set that example in 1947. Joseph McCarthy was the lowest rated senator or, uh, uh, in the United States uh, from Wisconsin. Here's a guy who, you know, was a boxer in college, he had that bully mentality, uh, who was looking for some positive publicity. And when he saw Richard Nixon and the impact it had when he cried communism, he said, wait a second here, Nixon's on to something, and how can I manipulate these sets of circumstances for my own political end? He was a Republican senator from Wisconsin who saw the opportunity. <coughs> Um, a lot of interesting background stories to this. The idea that the Republican Party had been out of office since 1932 and many were desperate for power. So you've got to consider the Democratic Party had had a monopoly in the American landscape since Roosevelt first became president and was elected president in November 1932. And, um, you know, for the most part, um, the Republicans were getting desperate. And if gutter tactics, uh, smear campaigns were going to win you over, then um, then so be it, you know. And I think this is where you can see a little bit of that commonality with the Trump administration uh, in the kind of smear campaigns that Trump used, particularly in the debates with Hillary Clinton, if you can remember those from 2016, and and just the the kind of things that are coming out of this administration, the the language the finger pointing, the fear, that's where I can see some similarities. Absolutely, I can see that. So, With FBI help, Joseph McCarthy toured the country claiming he had lists of names of communists in government. So he would go to Toledo and he'd make a pronouncement that in this file I have 121 names and everyone would gasp and he'd close his file and head off to the next town. Every town he went to, the number of people he had in his file would change. Um, but he basically just kind of stayed one step ahead and uh, of course he becomes heavily involved in HUAC as well because McCarthy is getting information uh, however accurate or inaccurate it is he's getting that information from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The actions gave McCarthy media attention and he was enjoying the publicity. You know I don't know if Joseph McCarthy would have known the difference between Groucho Marx or Karl Marx, frankly. I, I, I don't think he cared. I think he was someone who understood the, the impact that his publicity was having. He enjoyed it. He enjoyed the notoriety. He enjoyed rubbing elbows with famous people. Um, and he wasn't going to stop. Uh, so long as he was getting a reaction, so long as his name calling was 
putting a spotlight on him, McCarthy would just continue doing what he was doing. In the 1952 elections, the Republicans reaped the benefits of the hysteria. There's no question that a lot of people were driven to the Republican Party because their fear campaign of anti-communism had worked so effectively. Eisenhower appointed uh, Joseph McCarthy as head of a committee to investigate communists in government. Now this is where things get really difficult because now he isn't just a rogue senator doing what he wants. He is now a, a presidential appointed individual to do this. Now, Eisenhower's role in this is interesting because we know that in hindsight, Eisenhower did not like McCarthy. He did not like his tactics. He thought he was rude. He was arrogant. He was crass. But he also recognized that McCarthy's campaigns before 1952 had won the Republican Party votes. So I think he appointed McCarthy as head of this committee uh, just as a way to kind of thank him and move on. So, but once McCarthy has, pre has, has presidential support and endorsement, he, gets, he becomes even more bold and more brash. Empowered with presidential support, he bullied and accused hundreds of people. Those who spoke out themselves would be called un-American. There was no winning when you were accused of being a communist, <clears throat> or being a communist sympathizer for that matter. Um, so how did this work? Well, you'd receive notification that you were expected to attend a meeting or uh, a court hearing for HUAC, and you would be called to this meeting, and You'd be called to question about maybe your association with the Communist Party in the 30s, and there might be somebody who attended a meeting in 1932, and he may have said, well, yeah, I attended a meeting in 1932, but that was it. It wasn't my thing. Well, how do we know that you haven't worked privately in cahoots with the Soviet Union, so on and so on and so forth? In order to be absolved, we need you to give us five names of people that you know who might be associated with the Communist Party. So you're on the stand, freaking out, losing your mind, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I remember one time Charlie Chaplin saying something at a party, and I was about Stalin being a good guy. And then I was at a dinner party in San Francisco with Dalton Trumbo, and he made some comments about how great the Soviet Union was. So essentially what you would do is you would give five names, and those five people would be called to question, and then they would be expected to give five names. So this thing would kind of trickle and spin out of control very, very quickly. <coughs> the climate of fear developed in the worst domestic witch hunt since the 1600s. What you see happening in the United States is you see a democracy under siege from a sort of dictatorial, totalitarian type of fear. And it was the closest we ever came, or the Americans ever came rather, to some type of dictatorship. Uh, although there wasn't one officially from a leadership perspective, the kind of fear that permeated, everyone was looking over their shoulder, everyone was terrified of being accused. People begin to accuse others to detract from themselves. So maybe rather than just sitting and waiting for them to come knocking on my door, I'm going to go and blame somebody else. Uh, and this is really the ugly side of McCarthyism, is it brings out the worst in people. So. George Marshall. You might recall we talked about him last uh, lecture when we looked at the Marshall Plan. Um, <clears throat> was accused of allowing China to go communist. Like he had any ability of altering and changing events in China. Uh, it's pretty remarkable. But from a layman's perspective, reading the media in, in the U.S., it wasn't unplausible that his lack of action in China is responsible for Mao Zedong becoming leader. Hundreds of university teachers were dismissed as a result of pressure from McCarthy. This, this extended well beyond Hollywood and, 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 and screenwriters. Professors who were known as being liberal, open-minded, left-wing, whatever term you want to use. Uh, deans of universities were put under pressure from McCarthyites to release certain professors. So professors are losing their jobs. Uh, so it was, it was extremely pervasive. 324 Hollywood actors, writers are blacklisted. Blacklisted basically means that they're forbidden from working in Hollywood. <clears throat> so what happens is 
Um, in the case of Dalton Trumbo, for example, a screenwriter who is now completely out of work, he would write screenplays, and I believe My Fair Lady was one of them, that, and Spartacus, although by the time he wrote Spartacus, I think he was absolved, absolved rather, of the McCarthy period, and could freely come out and publish screens, screenplays on his own. But I believe My Fair Lady is one that he submitted to a friend who then would put his name on it and it would be released. And yes, the, the, the person whose name it was on would get all the fanfare, but then he would give Trumbo money. Right? So that's how these guys made a living is that they would, they would uh, submit screenplays to people who would cover for them and publish them under a different name. So. Walt Disney, Jack Warner, and Louis Meyer were, were known to support HUAC. Now, before you throw them under the bus, you have to consider the tremendous pressure they're under. Uh, their whole industry is under pressure, and, uh, you know, they don't want to lose their ability to make films. And I'm not, I'm not rationalizing it. I'm suggesting that um, it probably made more sense from their perspective to support HUAC than it is to defy it. So, anti-communist allegories were produced, like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Here we go on the bottom. If now, as a Hollywood filmmaker, you can make really powerful anti-Soviet allegories and metaphorical films, then you're doing your duty to stop the spread of uh, perverse communist ideas in film and music and entertainment. Um, you know, coming back to those film directors who, and screenwriters who wrote pro-Soviet films uh, during the war years, they were encouraged and requested by the FDR administration to do so, yet during the McCarthy period, they were called to question. You know, the irony of that, you know, um, is quite remarkable, you know. So, uh, nobody was exempt. It was a very, very difficult period. Well, not everyone supported McCarthy, but those that didn't support him were best to just keep their mouth shut. And this is where we get into the sort of the totalitarian nature and climate of fear that is created in this epidemic of fear during the McCarthy period. Um, public polls showed he never achieved 50% approval from Americans. Some politicians and actors spoke out against the hysteria, huge risk. Um, it was a lot better from an employment perspective to, to come out for Ronald Reagan. Uh, Aliyah Kazan, the American director, um, were people who came out in support of HUAC. Um, objective media like the Washington Post, New York Times, produced sensible and balanced reporting that damaged McCarthy's credibility. TV journalist Edward Murrow produced a program on See It Now where he challenged McCarthy. There he is, Edward Murrow. He is, his show See It Now, was investigative journalism. His show was the precursor to what would later become 60 Minutes. And what Murrow does is he invites McCarthy onto his show to talk about what's happening in the United States. And McCarthy had the good sense to decline because he knew that uh, and Murrow was very good at his job, he could ask probing questions, he may present an unflattering view of McCarthy, so he basically said, oh, I'm too busy, uh, can't make it. So Murrow decided to make a little clip about McCarthyism, and he showed clips from HUAC, he talked to people, and of course, as a result of this, it was very, very unflattering. <coughs> and of course, McCarthy lashes out at Murrow, saying that he's a communist sympathizer, blah, blah, blah. But I think that Murrow was extremely important in, in providing a sort of balanced, sensible view on what was happening in the United States because so many people were being hurt, so many people were being blacklisted, were being tarnished by this anti-communist brush that was making broad strokes all over American society, um, that you needed pragmatism, you needed reason. You needed responsible journalism, and I think Murrow provided that. Lastly, when McCarthy went after the U.S. military, his accusations came off as preposterous to Americans. Why does he go after the military? Well, 
Yeah, and what's interesting is, of course, the U.S. military is generally pretty conservative, so the likelihood of the U.S. military being communist sympathizers is pretty slim. What it was is that Roy Cohn, his lawyer, McCarthy's lawyer, was homosexual, whose boyfriend, partner, was a fellow named David Schein, who was getting what was deemed as unfair treatment in the military. He was in the military. And so I think Roy Cohn was standing up for his partner uh, indirectly because he couldn't say this, but that's one of the reasons that they go after Shine. So, you know, McCarthy and, and, um, and, uh, and Cohn are both doing this for opportunistic reasons. Army lawyer Joseph Welsh calmly brought to light the recklessness of McCarthy proclaiming, Have you no sense of decency? Joseph Welsh, what a remarkable piece of film, if you get the chance to watch this on YouTube, where he just sits and listens for days upon days, McCarthy berating people, going after people, his maps and his charts and his, you know, and he finally says, Mr. McCarthy, have you no sense of decency? And McCarthy didn't know how to respond to that. And there it was on television. Television becomes a pretty... Um, important part of this narrative because people are watching the McCarthy hearings on television. You know, haven't you done enough? Haven't you destroyed too many people's lives? And of course McCarthy mutters away but on the screen you can just see and actually in the audience at HUAC people actually kind of applaud Welsh. It's almost like everybody was just kind of waiting for this to happen. Nobody had the guts to come out and say something but when someone powerful and important like Joseph Welsh or Edward Murrow stand up against the recklessness of this McCarthy business, then people feel safe and comfortable to come out and express how they really feel. After the Army hearings, um, he lost all credibility um, and he would die very soon thereafter in 1957 a tired and ruined alcoholic. After the Army hearings, nobody wanted to see McCarthy. Nobody wanted him on the front page. Everybody it was almost like people said, we can't believe we allowed this to happen for so long. We are so ashamed. Get rid of the guy. We don't want to see him. The guy, McCarthy, um, went from being a number one rock star in American politics and media to the back page of every second-class newspaper in the country. Uh, nobody wanted to hear about this guy. and He ended up just drinking himself to death um, just a couple years later. So, um, so at the end of McCarthyism, even though McCarthy is disgraced and this period comes to end, an end rather, it takes upwards of a decade to two, right up until the 1970s for many of those blacklisted actors and screenwriters to get back to making films on their own. I mean, Dalton Trumbo had the good fortune of having Kirk Douglas uh, go stick his neck out in, in encouraging uh, Trumbo, and of course Trumbo would write Spartacus, the 1960 film of which Kirk Douglas would play the starring role, and that kind of becomes uh, Dalton Trumbo's uh, ticket out of the, the, the um, darkness of the McCarthy period. So. So what did America learn? Well, trying to make sense of McCarthyism is difficult because it was, it was so multi-layered, but it's fair to say that the general Red Scare was part of a more widespread yearning for the U.S. to return to traditional values disrupted by the chaos of the Depression and the war. I mean, since 1929 to 1945, there had been an incredible period of instability, fear, and economic chaos. People were dying for a return to normalcy. And what I'm trying to suggest here is that people feared anything that could undermine Americans' ability to get back to being normal. That's why in the 1950s there's such a big push towards conformity. White picket fences, 2.3 kids, you know, uh, leave it to beaver, you know, mom cooking bread in the kitchen, dad reading a paper in the living room, perfectly crew-cutted uh, children behaving themselves, fishing in the ponds and going to school. Like It was almost like 
or Father Knows Best would be another example. Everybody just wanted to, to, to live the perfect life. And, 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 and if conformity was going to bring them comfort, then so be it. Little boxes, as you know, um, you know, folk singers would sing about. Uh, just living in a perfect little world where every little house and every little yard looked the same. But those baby boom kids who grew up in this sort of age of conformity would become teenagers in the 1960s. And I would argue that civil rights, the rock and roll movement, and the emerging youth culture of the 1960s would be a broad reaction against the repressive conservatism of the 1950s. The hippie movement, the counterculture, were young people saying, I am sick and tired of living in a perfect little box. I do not want to live my parents' lives. I do not want to conform. I want to uh, chart my own course. So we're going to grow our hair long. We're going to wear tie-dye shirts. We're going to listen to strange music. And we're going to smoke smelly cigarettes. Um, so, you know, the broad sweep of this is that did the Americans learn something? Absolutely. Um, but here we are, frankly, in the age of Trump. And I must admit that uh, it's a bit perplexing when you look at the lessons of history, you know, that we should be going through something that... that has all the hallmarks of aspects of McCarthyism, you know, some 60 years after all this came to a, a, an end. So, that being said, uh, I want to thank you very much for continuing to enjoy my YouTube lectures. Uh, don't hesitate to comment um, on my page if you have any recommendations. You know, I'm trying my best to fill these time slots in about 35 minutes uh, so that they're they're, uh, they're doable within a reasonable amount of time. Certainly there are things I'm not mentioning or I'm overlooking, but really the function here is to just give you the broad sort of sweeping narrative of these historical circumstances. So anyway, thank you very much and I appreciate it.